coming up. Ten years after they find John Doe, Larry Eiler says, you know, I'm the reason that that skeleton was in those woods. For Vault Studios, I'm Reed Redmond. You're listening to The Daily Crime. For nearly 40 years, the family of 19-year-old Billy Lewis didn't know what happened to him. This is the last picture ever taken of then 19-year-old Billy Lewis. The Jasper, Indiana native disappeared in 1982 on his way home from a funeral in Texas. Until late last year, when they found out he'd been a victim of a serial killer. A moment of closure finally for one Indiana family here at the Jasper County Sheriff's Department, a moment that they had waited 40 years to get, finally learning what happened to their uncle and brother who disappeared in the 80s, finding out he was the victim of a serial killer known as the Interstate Killer. Joining us from WTHR in Indianapolis is reporter Emily Longnecker. Emily, take us through the history of this case, starting with the disappearance of a young man named Billy Lewis in 1982. What were the circumstances surrounding his disappearance? Billy Lewis was 19 years old. Um, He was from Peru, Indiana, and he was returning home from a friend or a family member's funeral in Texas. And he disappeared. He never, he never made it home. He never made it to Peru. And his family didn't know what happened to him. His mother, even at one point, wrote a letter to Unsolved Mysteries, seeking information about uh, him because she always believed that, um, you know, in her heart that he was alive out there somewhere. But in talking with his uh, family members, his brother said, you know, one day he was there and one day he was not. They reported him missing, um, but nothing nothing ever came of it. This was almost 40 years ago now. What else can you tell us about what the investigation looked like back in the 80s? Were there any clues at all as to what might have happened? There were no clues as to what happened to Billy. It, um, his family said that he was known to hitchhike. Um, and so they weren't sure if that's, you know, what he was doing uh, as he was making his way, you know, back to Indiana from Texas, but they just didn't know. And in about a year after he disappeared, some remains were found in Jasper County, Indiana in 1983. But the dots were really not connected at the time. Back in 1983, it seemed like every other week more bodies were being discovered in farm fields like this one. While scores of lawmen scattered between Chicago, Terre Haute, Indianapolis, even as far away as Ohio, struggled to compare notes, connect the dots, and put an end to the carnage. No connection was made that, hey, maybe this is Billy Lewis who is missing. So investigators had those remains for years and he was known as John Doe. And um, the, the, one of the investigators that first came upon the, the skeletal remains buried some of them in an, um, in a, in a grave under a John Doe marker in Jasper County. And then they saved um, the rest. And it wasn't until 10 years later when a man who's come to be known as the interstate killer, uh, Larry Eiler, who was in prison, uh, convicted of killing a 15-year-old in Chicago and and facing the death penalty. He confessed to over uh, 20 murders in, uh, in the 80s of young men. Convicted in Chicago of one murder and sentenced to death, Eiler confessed with remarkable detail to 21 brutal killings. Larry confessed to just picking them up along the road. They were just hitchhiking. Including this John Doe that had been found in Jasper County 10 years earlier. But at the time, he couldn't tell investigators anything about John Doe. Didn't didn't know his name, couldn't couldn't give them any information as to who this uh, man was, uh, whose life he took. So for decades, the family of Billy Lewis has no idea that that any of this is going on that that investigators are learning more and more about this John Doe, right? Right. They don't get yeah, right. They they just know that Billy has disappeared. They don't know where Billy is. They have no answers. They don't know about these remains being found. They don't they don't know that, you know, uh, that the police have these remains that, that that turn out to be 
um, the remains of Billy. Um, they have no idea. And police, you know, have no idea. They just know this person as John Doe. And 10 years after they find John Doe, Larry Eiler says, you know, I'm the reason that that skeleton was in those woods. Just recently then, these dots were were finally all connected. This family gets some news from the Jasper County Sheriff's Office. What exactly is it that they learned? So they learned that... Um, One of um, Billy's siblings, uh, one of them at least that had given DNA, learned that um, she was a direct match to the the remains found and that this was in fact her brother. Basically, the coroner in Jasper County said, you know, he inherited this case and, uh, you know, 20 some years ago. I've been entrusted with this case from three sheriffs ago and and have, have dug at it for 20 some years and over the years as DNA has you know become what it is you know investigators have been able to find out more so um, most recently last year they decided let's take another look at this case we're going to try and find out who John Doe is and they worked with a company out of Massachusetts called Redgrave Research Forensic Services and basically they they took some DNA from the skeletal remains that they had and basically it's my understanding that the DNA profile of the remains was uploaded into something called GED match, which is, um, it's like a family tree system of sorts. And you, um, you know how people are now doing like 23 and me and all of these things to discover their ancestry, right? So it's my understanding when you do these different services, you can check a box that says, Hey, if you want to upload my DNA profile into like a bigger database, uh, you can, so that if, people want to find me or connect me with anything else, they can. And so um, this GED match was able to connect some dots and say, hey, these remains, these could be possible matches to these different ancestors. And so they they traced it down to um, Billy's sister and investigators called her up and said, look, this there's a potential here that this could be, you know, a match, but we need to get a DNA sample from you to, to absolutely confirm it. So um, she, you know, willingly gave the, the, the DNA sample and it was a match. So the family um, discovered that uh, this is this is their brother. This is Billy. Um, his parents have since passed on. His mother died last year, um, never knowing uh, what had really happened to her son. My dad said he just disappeared. He was there one day and then gone the next. Thursday, Billy's nephew, who wasn't even born when his uncle disappeared, spoke about the long-awaited closure for his family. I mean, we always wanted to meet him, but, I mean, everybody had that thought in the back of their head that, you know, he was he was gone. And genetic genealogy, of course, is, is something that investigators didn't have back in 1982. They really had right. no way to, to connect these dots. That's right. And even... Um, At one point, they did some other DNA testing um, several years ago, and they ran it through a system called CODA, um, which is a, you know, national law enforcement system. But basically, the only matches that would have come up there would be if Billy's parents had been in the system, and they were not. So... They they got no matches. They got no hits. So, okay. And so then fast forward a few years. Now we have this genealogy um, forensics um, that has come about. And uh, and this is what ultimately was able to identify him. And, And investigators, the coroner said, you know, they think this is probably the future. What else did we hear from Billy Lewis's surviving relatives about what it's been like to get this news? Answers as to what happened, but but also a confirmation that you know, what they feared happened, happened. Right. So two of his nephews were there uh, at this uh, news conference. Only one of his nephews spoke. And this nephew is in his early 30s, right? So he, you know, Billy, his uncle disappeared and was gone before he was even born. So he always grew up hearing about this uncle that had disappeared. Um, And they had no idea. And his grandmother this, this nephew, you know, his grandmother had died not knowing what had happened to her son. And uh, he talked about that, like that his grandmother had, you know, written a letter to Unsolved Mysteries and always felt like her child was somewhere out there. She never really truly believed that something bad had happened to him. Um, 
a lot of the other family, you know, had come to, I guess, some realization that he probably was not um, coming back. But the family was um, relieved to to finally have some answers. Um, the nephew said, you know, his aunts, Billy's sisters, were were having a hard time with it because this was, you know, bringing it all up again forty years later. Um, finally, having those answers, and uh, they were they are planning a service for him. Um, where they will finally um, bury him in a uh, cemetery in Peru near his father. We're close knit family, so it's a it's a nice feeling to finally figure out what happened. You mentioned that Larry Eiler was on death row when he confessed to to this and, and a number of other killings. But as I understand, he died in prison before he could be executed. Right. Right. That is correct. That is correct. Emily Longnecker with WTHR, thanks for sharing the story with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Daily Crime. We're here with a new one every day of the week, Monday through Friday. So make sure you're subscribed to or following the podcast wherever it is you're listening right now. If you're looking for more podcasts, you can head over to voltstudios.com for a full list of our shows, or you can search Volt Studios in your podcast app. That'll do it for this one. Until next time, for Volt Studios, I'm Reed Redmond.